afternoon. It, when we have a nice luncheon and we have a kind of dreary afternoon, I, as a veteran teacher, know that that can be a recipe for nap time. But this afternoon will not be nap time because we have a very exciting speaker. And that is the Reverend Dr. Kevin Johnson, who is the senior pastor of Bright Hope Baptist Church in North Philadelphia near the Temple campus. Um, if any of you from Philadelphia know about Bright Hope, it has always been on the vanguard of uh, political involvement in this city. Uh, Congressman Bill Gray was the senior pastor there uh, for many years, and it has always been a flagship congregation. So uh, Dr. Johnson came there seven years ago, and um, uh, he assures me that in his seven years that he's been in Philadelphia, he has learned to love our city, its culture, and especially its restaurants. He's a foodie. And, um, but uh, Dr. Johnson is also very active in the leadership of uh, POWER. You'll be hearing a lot more about POWER. It's a, a broad-based community organization here in the city, faith-based, uh, affiliated with the organizing network PICO. The executive director is going to be honored uh, as one of our distinguished alums, uh, Bishop Dwayne Royster. And Dr. Johnson is one of his uh, leaders in power. Uh, Dr. Johnson is uh, happily married for only 17 years. Uh, you're following up on the craze who ha have weighed in at 40 years. And he has three children who are 13, eight, and six, all in the Philadelphia public school system. He is a tireless advocate for uh, public education in this city and in this state. So um, we were very fortunate to get uh, on his uh, busy schedule this afternoon. I hope that you will read uh, some of his uh, academic credentials, which are um, glittering, a Phi Beta Kappa and Magna Cum Laude graduate of Morehouse, a very elite school where he got the Martin Luther King Jr. and the Oprah Winfrey Scholarship. So he has Oprah's money, so that mu must mean he's coming to make a big contribution to the Alumni Association, yeah. Uh, he got his MDiv at Union Seminary, uh, was a Union scholar, and got the Maswell Fellowship, uh, something we share, actually, at Union. Um, he has been, um, he earned his uh, Doctor of Ed in Organizational Leadership and Transformational Learning at Columbia University. Um, he is on many boards, including uh, Lincoln University, the Union League, uh, Forum for a Better Pennsylvania, the Mayor's Voters Task Force. He was with the Obama campaign. Newsweek featured him as an up-and-coming post-civil uh, rights minister, and the Philadelphia Tribune identified him as one under 40 to watch. We watch everybody who's under 40 here. So <laughs> he's, a, he's a mover and shaker and um, has been a, a part in, in his short ter time here in Philadelphia. He has certainly, you will see him in the media speaking on behalf of power and for um, uh, public school advocacy. You'll hear about him, you'll see him quoted in the newspaper. He has established himself as a major presence uh, already in the city. So please join me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Kevin Johnson. Hey, give um, Dr. Katie Day a round of applause just for that all the lies that she just told. But you know, I've gotten to the place where I start to believe whatever lies people say about me. So thank you again, I appreciate it. It's uh, so great to, uh, to be here 
and to be here at Lutheran Theological uh, Seminary. I am quite honored uh, to have been asked to come and to speak today. And particularly, I want to uh, thank uh, the president of this distinguished uh, seminary, um, President Philip uh, Cray, uh, for his leadership. I also want to thank um, uh, Reverend uh, Vice President uh, Louise Johnson uh, for her invitation, and I've already thanked uh, Dr. Uh, Kay. I also see uh, Dr. Robertson, who is here, and uh, thank him for allowing me to serve on the Utica board, and also my uh, good friend and um, uh, brother. Uh, he has done a great work here, and he's also part of the faculty, and that is Dr. Wayne Croft. Um, I thought about what I needed to say, and, and literally, as I was sitting at this table, Tom changed everything. So I need to uh, take down this PowerPoint presentation. I'm just joking, just joking, just joking. Uh, but I am glad to be here. Um, one, just to talk about change and to talk about renewal. I know this is going to be difficult uh, because you all just finished eating. And um, you may be thinking about that nap. But if you can just give me a few minutes, uh, hopefully we'll have some nuggets that may be helpful for us today. Today we're talking about um, the renewal of the church. And for me, in order to talk about the renewal of the church, you literally have to go back and to look at what does that look like. And so if you have your Bibles with you, if you don't mind turning with me uh, to an important scripture that will really serve as the focus, uh, at least for me today, and I pray even for you, as we look at um, this theme, uh, you call it the renewal of the church, and I want to call it Dare to be Great Again. If you'll turn with me, and you can look here on the screen, uh, and let's read it together. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if you want servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. We are all familiar with this particular text and particularly with the prophet and the brother by the name of Nehemiah. We know it because this is the story that talks about the rebuilding of the walls. And we know the story that Jerusalem had been torn down and, and because of the captivity that had taken place, the city was desolate. It was in very bad shape. But what we often forget and what I want to help us to begin to see even today as we talk about renewal and particularly this thing that God has given me for today and that is to dare to be great again is I want us to really wrestle with the question, why is it so difficult for our churches to be great again? It's not a question of have we been great? Yes, we have been great. But the real question is, is how can we be great again? In fact, if you look at this text, particularly here in Nehemiah chapter two, you will see a question that is raised by the king that if we're really honest with ourselves, it's a question that we wrestle with even in our churches now. And that is the question of the king raises, what is it you want? Turn to somebody next to you and just say to him or her, what is it that you want? I'm trying to help you out, Tom, come on, help me out. <laughs> if we're really honest with ourselves, does this work? Can I get this microphone here to work? I just, just turn on. Wonder if I want to move around. If we're really honest with ourselves, this is really a question that all of us are wrestling with. What is it we want? I mean, I know right now some of y'all want to go to sleep, but you can't go to sleep, so that's, you got to take that away. Uh, there are others who may want to go back home, but you can't leave until you complete this great weekend. What is it that you want? This is really a question that's not even just applied just to Nehemiah, but it's applied to us individually. It's applied to us personally. What is it that we want? When we look at this word want and we look at uh, desire, uh, to want something is to feel a need or a desire for. It is to wish for or it is something that you crave for. Uh, whenever I'm on my fast, I crave for chocolate. I crave for anything sweet. 
And when I'm going through my fast, I realize that I have this desire, and if I can conquer it, then it will help me look a little bit better, so I'm still working on it. I haven't totally gotten there. But it's not just this question that the king raises to Nehemiah, what is it that you want? But it is also what we have to understand, even as the, Paul says in Galatians, because some things that we want are not really what God wants us to have. And we hear the Apostle Paul talking about desires when he says, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not, so you are not to do whatever you want. The reality is that some things that we want are not really good for us. There's some things that we desire that really have no place if we're trying to grow. And what I have begun to see in my generation is that there are people who want to have large congregations, but that may not be what God said for you to have. There may be some who want to have a particular ministry, but that may not be what God wants you to have because it's in conflict with the spirit. So the question then becomes is, what is it that we want? And Nehemiah, in my opinion, answers the question in a very clear and powerful way that I want us to really wrestle with today. And let's read it together. The text says, I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. I want us to think about that. Nehemiah desired not to go to a place that was already built, but he desired to go where? To a place that was desolate, to a place that was in need. And really the heart of our ministry is not to go to the places where you're on top of the mountain, but really our ministry is to go into the valleys. And oftentimes what I have found with uh, my own peers and those colleagues in ministry is that we want the easy road, but sometimes God wants you to take the rough road so that you will know the power of why he has called you to do what he's called you to do. And so the question for us is this, as we look today, is that Nehemiah said, I want to go back and to rebuild. Why did Nehemiah go back? He, he had an image of what Jerusalem and Judah looked like. He had an image of what um, took place when his mother and fathers were there. He had an image. And really, as I have heard, as you have been wrestling with questions today, even you have an image of what the Lutheran faith looks like. You remember the stories. You heard your mother. You heard your father. You read the history. And the question really is today, how can Lutherans, how can Baptists, how can Episcopals, how can we become great again? We're in an age now where there's yoga and people have all types of things that they can do. I mean, she already, Dr. K, she already read to you that we have three children. Um, my daughter has a gymnastics competition coming up uh, this coming uh, Saturday. And earlier this year in March, the first Sunday in March, I missed church because she had a gymnastics competition in Pittsburgh. Now you have to understand, I'm a pastor. I can't afford to miss church. But I missed church because I was missing too many of her gymnastics competitions. And what I began to realize is that there is a world that is out there and people are not necessarily coming to church. They have decided to make other life choices. Sometimes it may be yoga. Sometimes it may be their children. And so how can we make the church relevant again for people who have a plethora of choices? I grew up in a family uh, where we were in church all day on Sunday. We went to Sunday school, went to the morning worship service, uh, went home or stayed at the church and ate, came to the three o'clock service, uh, may have used the bathroom, came back to the Baptist training union at six o'clock, and then we had evening worship service at seven o'clock. I'm thankful I'm still in the church. That's too much church. I had my lifetime of church by the time I got to be 18 years old. 
But there's a generation that does not have that mindset. And so how can we begin to give them an image when they have no image to begin with? How can we give them a faith when they don't have a faith to begin with? And so Nehemiah helps us here. He says, I want to go back to rebuild. And I simply want to deposit to you the reason Nehemiah wanted to go back and to rebuild is because Nehemiah wanted to be great. Turn to somebody and tell him or her, do you want to be great? I mean, that's really the question. Do you want to be great? There's a quote that I live by that says, some men succeed because they are destined to, but most men succeed because they are determined to. I'll give it to you again. I'll quote it for women. Some women succeed because they are destined to, but most women succeed because they are determined to. Nehemiah wanted to be great, but Nehemiah realized that nothing was going to be handed to him. Nehemiah wanted to be great, but he realized the road was not going to be easy. Nehemiah wanted to be great, but he understood that he had to do it. That's the reason why Nehemiah said, notice he didn't say, we want to rebuild, but he said what? So that I, everybody say I, so that I can rebuild it. If there is going to be change in the Lutheran faith, if there's going to be change in the Baptist faith, the Episcopal faith, other faiths, it, all it takes is for one person to have the courage to say we want our faith to be great again. What are the challenges for today's church? First thing is it's difficult to put new wine into old wineskins. I don't know, do Lutherans, do y'all drink wine? Okay. I remember I was um, in Baltimore and I was preaching at an Episcopal church and there was a gentleman who was there and he said, you know, Reverend, I used to be a Baptist. And I said, uh, really? You know, and he said, but I'm an Episcopal now. And um, he had a cup and I said, you know, what led to your becoming an Episcopal? He said, oh, Reverend, the Episcopals, they believe in wine. <laughs> and so this, it's difficult really for us if we're really in our churches trying to grow them. And that is how do we put new wine into old wineskins? There's a generation that is coming along that does not even know what a wineskin is. They don't know what a hymn is. They don't understand the liturgy. They don't understand the structure. So how can we put new wine into old wine skins? And what I am discovering and what many others are discovering is that instead of telling them how to do it, begin to ask them, how should we do it? Invite them into the process so that they are helping to build the walls. Second thing that we begin to discover about the challenges in today's churches is that any change is viewed as erasing the history versus building upon it. And I'm going to talk some more about that really from my own context because as I begin to look at this, anytime you begin to make change, there's a, uh, I'm going to play it for you a little bit later. How many of y'all listen to Sam Cooke? You won't go to hell if you listen to Sam Cooke. But he had a song that was called, A Change Is Going To Come. It's a powerful song because it deals with the realities of life, and the only thing that is constant in life is change itself. And many times what I have found in faith traditions, on the work site, uh, even in my wife, what she does as an attorney in diversity, is that people do not want to change. Even as you look at um, this uh, owner of the Clippers basketball team, and the, the guy Bundy out there in Nevada, folk don't want to change. Listen, I ain't picking no cotton, so don't try to send me back there. But the reality is, is that people are stuck in a time warp. Things are changing all around us. And even as I look at where I am at Bright Hope, as I would talk about it a few, things are changing even there. Then thirdly, we have allowed for fear uh, to become central in our lives versus faith. 
You all remember that story there with the disciples. They are there in the, in the boat with Jesus in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. And the text shares with us that as they are there in the boat, that they're getting ready to go over to the other side. But the disciples, because of the waves, they become afraid. And Jesus says to them, why are you afraid? I thought you had faith now. Churches will never change and our denominations will never change as long as we operate in the spirit and in the space of fear versus faith. So what is the process to becoming great again? Well, I would submit to you that the process really has to do with either we cause the change or God will cause the change. And I share that with you because God sometimes will speak to us and tell us to do things as clergy leaders. But we will be like Moses and not want to do it because we're what? Afraid of what the people will say. But if you don't do it, then God has a way of doing it for you anyway. If you don't mind, turn with me to Genesis chapter 46. It has become one of my favorite uh, scriptures, Genesis chapter 46. Let me just ask this question. Why do you think the children of Israel, how do you, why do you think they ended up in Egypt? Why do you think they ended up in Egypt? Say hunger? <laughs> okay. Okay, why, why are you trying to take away my presentation? <laughs> we just let me just talk today. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 46, and I promise you this is going to bless you today. Genesis 46. I have often wondered why they ended up in Egypt. One, because I thought it was the famine. Two, I thought it was because of Joseph. But Genesis 46 uh, speaks to us and tells us who's really responsible for it. Begin at verse 1, it says, When Israel set out on his journey with all the land, and came to Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid. You see that word afraid again. To go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. Text goes on and says, I myself will go with you down to Egypt and I will also bring you back up again. I never looked at that text like that before. Now, to give you the context for this, for Genesis 46, God first speaks the promise of the promised land to Abram in Genesis chapter 12 in which he tells him what to go to the land that I will show you God does not tell him what how he's going to get there he just simply says go and I will turn you into a great nation you'll be fruitful you know you will be blessed everybody who comes in contact with you will be blessed but he does not tell him how he just tells him to go it's not until we get to Genesis chapter 46 that God tells us where the, he is going, where the seed, where the promise that he made with Abraham is actually going to come to fruition and how he's going to do it. It's in Egypt. It's in the places that we do not want to go to. And what this text shares to me is that, you see, Isaac God speaks to him, but he speaks to him. He calls him by name. He says, Jacob. When he speaks to him by Jacob, he's speaking to the Jacob because that's the fear of Jacob of going to Egypt. And it is there, literally, beloved, that when he speaks to him and tells him to go to Egypt, and he said, it is there that I will turn you into a great nation. How many of us have missed our blessings because we don't want to go to Egypt? How many of us have missed the great opportunities because we are afraid to go to Egypt? And one of two choices, either you can make the change or God will make the change. 
As I think about that, Bright Hope Church, I'm privileged to pastor and serve for these past seven years. Um, God has been doing things, has been moving things, because God is trying to move the church into a different direction. And literally, uh, recently we experienced, you know, some people are saying, you know, uh, there's no such thing as bad news. If you got good news, it's good news. Even if you got bad news, it's still good news. Um, well, recently, uh, I got hit uh, because I'm starting to realize I'm becoming more of a public figure. And a few weeks ago, we were on the front page of the Daily News. And I didn't like that title, Ultra Ego, you know. Pastor under fire at high profile church, mutiny possible. I wanted to, I was, where's the mutiny? Because when I looked and I saw the people who were there on Easter Sunday after this article came out, the church was packed. But I share this with you because this marquee, um, it literally took about five years to get. As much as people know about Bright Hope Baptist Church, there was never a sign that said where the church was. The most that the church had was a plaque that was about the size of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that was mounted onto the wall by one of the steps that said Bright Hope Baptist Church. And one of the things I wanted to do was to get a marquee and the trustees, they fought back and they said, why do we need a marquee? Because everybody knows where Bright Hope is. Now, mind you, we're right across from Temple University. And so you have students who don't know about this church, don't know about the history. And we needed a way in order to get people to come. And when I saw this image, I said, wow, God, you're, you're speaking in a mighty way because literally the first time I made the presentation to the trustees, they pushed back. And I had to wait about another three years. And then we finally got the marquee. That was one of the recent changes. Another change that has been taking place, and um, we only had to mark it about two years now, is that in the North Philadelphia area, literally when you come, our church is by Temple University, the whole neighborhood is changing. Yes, you can say it's gentrification, but literally there are a number, uh, since I've been there, I've seen changes that have really been for the better. Uh, streets are cleaner, you know, better buildings, getting rid of urban blight. And one of the things that when I first got there that I had to work on was there's this, there was this old middle school right across the street from the church, the old John and Wanamaker building. And Reverend Gray passed the baton to me. He said, now you're the president of Bridge of Hope Community Development Corporation. And he said, look, I'm gone. Bye. I'm moving down to Florida to be with my wife and my family. And so since they gave me the nickname of Joshua, and because I believe in the Bible, what do you think we did on Easter Sunday? We marched around the property seven times. And I had somebody go and get me a shofar, the ram's horn. <laughs> and it took me a little while to blow it because I had to get my lips right. But finally I blew it and we blew the shofar. And God made a way where we were able to partner with the developer the church did not have any money um, to put into this partnership, but we, deve we developed a partnership with the developer that allowed for us to become uh, part owners, and the building started to come down, and we began to move uh, forward even more so. Um, we broke ground in 2012, and this is what the building is going to look like, and it will go online in August 2014. Literally, God is changing everything around the church. And the question that Bright Hope and the question that you as Lutherans have to ask the question, are you going to be ready to change? And so with it, I have to share with you about that, but that was, those were changes that took place since I've been there. 
But there was a renaissance that was taking place in North Philadelphia in the edifice that we have now at Bright Hope that took place under Dr. William H. Gray, Jr., my predecessor's father. And the question that I had to pose to Bright Hope is why did Bright Hope in 1963 decide to update and build new facilities? One of my deacons shared this with me, and it was based upon urban renewal. And this is, as you can see right here, uh, Dr. King uh, is here. He was there for the groundbreaking. Matter of fact, he was one who was there for the groundbreaking, but also preached the first sermon in the church. And in 1963, Bright Hope decided to step out on faith, leave their old Gothic-like structure, and to build a modern facility that was going to be valued at $1 million. And the caption that really spoke to me the most, because that top picture is the old Gothic-like structure, and I've kind of superimposed it for you. And the caption read, ugly, outmoded, the old Bright Hope Baptist Church building stands what? Alone in an area cleared for urban renewal. That was 1963. And literally 50 years later, the community is going through a change again. And one of the challenges that I am facing at the church right now is are we willing to change? Because if you don't change, you become obsolete. If you don't change, then you become like this. What's this? It's an old what? Kodak camera. What recently happened to Kodak? They went out of business. They had to what? File bankruptcy I mean it, the whole thing collapsed now Kodak developed the technology to develop film they have the patents for that but Kodak is great as it now where's my dollar <laughs> <That's two dollars. laughs> Kodak became obsolete and not only they become obsolete, but there's something else that is there that is related to Kodak. And, and really, our churches, you know, they're becoming obsolete. Now, what's also going to make it very interesting for you is not only did Kodak become obsolete, even though they had the technology with the film, but Kodak also developed the technology for the digital camera. So how is it that you can be the ones to have the knowledge and have the patents for not only for film, but also for the digital camera, but yet you go out of business? It is because, as I've started off with this premise today, is that they failed to dare to imagine and dare to be great again. There's a scripture by Paul that blesses my soul every time I read it and let's read it together now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us everything that you need it's already inside of you all the tools all the knowledge God's already placed it inside of you and so what I want us to do for these next few moments, I just wanted to kind of break the ice. And that is, I want us to really wrestle with the question, how can we become great again? How can the Lutheran faith become great again? How can we begin to dare to imagine? At Bright Hope, we have this theme, as you've kind of seen, a church where people believe, imagine, and grow that believe, imagine, and grow is simply an acronym for big, B-I-G. And what I tell folk is that we're going big for God. And the way that you do it, you first got to believe in him. Then you have to imagine, which means, well, I believe that when God, when you believe in him, he gives you an image of what he wants you to be. But then three, you have to grow into it. And what I have found with people is that they believe in God, 
God may give them an image, but they never grow into it because they are afraid versus having faith. And really, beloved, it gets around to our understanding, why are we here? And the reality is we would not be here if it was not for God's grace. In my context, we say his grace and his mercy. And so I think that that is powerful. I want to give you a few things and then uh, we will be done for today. Um, what I have also talked about when I've talked about church renewal is obviously talking about change and talking about growing. And that's where the whole believe, imagine, and grow comes from. But also, we have looked at four particular areas where there has to be change and there does have to be growth. Um, for me, it boils down to leadership. Um, you got to have the right leadership. Uh, if you read the Daily News article, um, there's some people who are quoted who are anonymous. They're part of the leadership. Um, but you have to change the leadership if the church is going to change. Can I be afraid of changing the leadership? Because those who are in leadership really want to replicate themselves. So if the wrong people are in leadership, then you're going to be reproducing the same thing. It's kind of like if GM has a new car, you cannot produce the new car if you're still using the same casting system. You have to change it in order to get something new. Uh, two, um, for us, and that means we change everything about worship, but you know, we have something for grandma, uh, we have something for mama, we have something for um, yeah, young adults, we have something for the youth. But worship has to be uh, in such a space where everybody who comes in, if you want to have an intergenerational church, and there's some uh, ministers who have moved straight to the youth crowd and they forget all about grandma. Then there are others who simply want the context of worship to be for grandma and therefore they don't have any youth. So you have to look at your liturgy and how can we become creative. Something we did uh, on Easter Sunday, which we had never done before, is that we had spoken word. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with spoken word, but it's like poetry and it's kind of, it's not rap, but it's uh, poetry in which, you know, these young folk, they are engaged in it. And a young woman, she did uh, the Trinity and she absolutely, I mean, there were old, young who were all excited but the young were very excited because they were like, I cannot believe Rev let her do spoken word on Sunday morning and on Easter Sunday at that. So it gave me a lot of cool points. So, you know, uh, that, that definitely helped out. Also, beloved families become very important. Uh, what we have started to do more and more, and since I've been here, I've even got a text from one of my, my youth directors is that we have focused a great deal on growing our families. Because if your church, if it's going to grow, then you gotta focus on families, you gotta have something for the mother, you gotta have something for the father, you have to have something for the children. And the more that we have focused on that, the more we have started to see uh, families come. And this may push and challenge you, but this is something that we've had to do as well. And that is not to be stuck on uh, the nuclear family. You know, I happen to be blessed, and my wife and I uh, are together, but I'm not a product of a nuclear family. Uh, I'm a product of divorced parents, had grandparents, you know, who helped to rear me. And what I've tried to do is to create a context that, yes, promotes the nuclear family, um, but also is welcoming for those families that do not have a husband or do not have a wife that is there, and the parent is single. And so making sure that they feel like they're part of it. Then the last part that has led to tremendous growth is in the area of youth. Um, I, I was going to show you a video of our summer camp and some other things that we have done. Um, but really focusing on our youth has, uh, in a great way, once you get the youth coming, and many of them will come on their own with their own friends. And when the parents see that their child is going, guess what? The parents will come as well. And so those are some four kind of key areas in worship and leadership, uh, families, and youth. And as I've said before, 
at least for us at Bright Hope, we're trying to become a church uh, that believes, imagines, and grows. And so we dare to be great. Uh, Bright Hope has a great history. Um, I didn't create it. It was already there before I arrived. And simply my mission there to try to renew our church is to help us to believe, to imagine, and to grow. And if we can go big for God, those three things, and there's no telling what we can do. And I say the same thing to you, that if you can just believe, everybody say believe, believe. Imagine, imagine, and grow, there's no telling what God will help you do, even in your own context. God bless you and thank you. Again, Again, the Nehemiah text um, was so central because he said that he wanted to go, one text says build, another says rebuild. And Nehemiah was not necessarily going to rebuild, you know, what was, um, but he was going to rebuild so they could move forward. Uh, the best way I can describe it, it is in uh, African culture, there is the Sankofa bird. And the bird is moving forward but its face or its neck is turned backwards. And so you have to move forward, but you have to know from whence you have come so that you don't make the same mistakes again. And so for me, uh, becoming great um, again is really, it's like climbing a step. You know, you're just going a little bit higher uh, than you were previously. That's a good question as far as theological education. I mean, obviously, I'm pretty sure that you'll have the students who go out into the field um, and do that work. But I think for theological education, um, and I can only speak from when I was in seminary, is that it does not prepare you for when you're going to be on the front page of the daily news. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, it does not prepare you for the people who are behind something like that. Um, seminary did a great job for me of deconstruction, which is why I went to Union. Um, however, as it relates to, really as it relates to the um, interfacing with people and really kind of understanding, uh, i give you one example. Uh, I was talking to one of my officers and uh, she shared with me, she said, you know, the daily news is, is, has more to do with the fact that uh, you stopped the uh, the congregation and the ushers from marching. Now, and at Bright Hope, we don't do it now, but um, uh, we did. Uh, when it came time for offering, people would walk around and they would bring the offering to the front of the church. And then the ushers, they would come and, you know, they would be marching and, you know, put their money, you know, in the front. And and trying to move the church forward because as you look at more modern worship styles, um, people are not doing that anymore. That is a tradition that has since passed. And what she said to me was, is that the reason that was important is because that gave the deacons an opportunity to shake people's hands. What she was really saying is that that allowed for them to feel important and that I took away their sense of feeling important. Field education has to get to that, that Maslow kind of you know, hierarchy of needs. And I think that if we're going to push the envelope further, it just cannot be about theology, it just cannot be about scripture, but it really has to deal with the psychology of what do people need, what helps them feel like there's a sense of worth. You would think because they're Christian, that's enough. No. It's about the title. It's about the position. And so how can we begin to help uh, those who are going out into the parish understanding that, yes, it is about Jesus Christ. It's about the faith. But also there's this whole psychology that is there, and how can you help to meet people's needs? I see the fear manifesting. Anytime there's resistance, it's normally uh, predicated by fear, okay? Anytime I sense resistance, like the whole, you know, ushers march around, that was predicated by fear. Um, the pulpit, you know, at the church, it used to be up on these steps, 
and the kind of history behind it, the church ran out of money because Dr. Gray wanted to build this beautiful uh, pulpit, but it didn't have enough money. And so they basically got some plywood, painted it white, put some um, velvet around at the top. And that's where everybody preached from Dr. King to Nelson Mandela to Desmond Tutu, uh, all the presidents, et cetera. But you had to walk up these steps and it was not the ideal pulpit. And I found this old pulpit that was in the basement that came from the old church um, that really was, looked more grand. Uh, but two, I wanted the pulpit to be close to the congregation. And uh, the officers, they went along with me. But once we made the move, there were some folk who were like, he moved, he moved the pulpit. He moved the pulpit. And I'm saying to myself, this is the old pulpit from the old church. So it's really bringing the old into the new. And for them, it was he's getting rid of the gray legacy, which was fearful, which therefore turns into resistance, but not really thinking from a practical, because I'm a mobile, as I'm moving around here, this is the way I am on Sunday mornings. So for me to keep going up and down these stairs, I may fall one time. <laughs> And not understanding that not only do you have a different pastor, if you want him to preach the word, then he has to be comfortable in where he stands. So that's, you know, one fear manifests itself in resistance. And how do you begin to move uh, people from their fears? And how do you begin to move them from their resistance? Um, it is through good pastoral care, you know. Uh, finding some of the key stakeholders in the church. And I remember going to one of the seniors in the church, and I said to her, I said, you know, sister so-and-so, I said, uh, do you remember this pulpit, the one that I found? I said, from the old church? She said, yeah, I remember. I said, Sister Griffin, all we're trying to do is to bring the old into the new. And she became one of my biggest champions, not because of a mandate that I gave, but because I went by to see her, put my hand around her, I ain't gonna give you a kiss, but I gave her a kiss. <laughs> and it was pastoral care that began to move the church forward. And so what I have found is that in order to move the church forward, there is, your, you know, there's gonna be resistance because people don't like change. But if you're not afraid to come off the podium and to come into the field where the people are, that you can begin to move the congregation forward. Now, there's no question about it, where the church is located, uh, there are a number of key stakeholders there in the community. Uh, the building that you all saw, um, which is a uh, $100 million facility, 14 stories, 800 bed, uh, is actually going to be housing for, stu for Temple students. But what I did not share with you is that when I arrived here, Temple University and Bright Hope were supposed to partner together. <laughs> but the deal fell through the day the bids were due. Now, my grandmother would say to me, baby, never put all your eggs in one basket. And so when the deal fell through with Temple, there was another developer, other developers who were calling me. And my metaphor was is that we're engaged, but we're not married. And so the day the bid fell apart, the other developer called, and we uh, partnered with them, were able to get this project done. Um, the deal fell apart under the old president, uh, Dr. Ann Weaver Hart. Now Temple has a new president. His name is Dr. Neil Theobald, who I think is absolutely great. And one of the things that I've learned uh, in ministry, I really learned this from my, um, one of my mentors, Dr. Butts, when I served in New York at Abyssinian, is that when you're dealing with powerful forces, the church, church's leadership is most of the time going to be the most stable leadership in the community. So therefore, those who are around you, nine times out of 10, are not always going to be there. So if you ask, why do, does Bright Hope now have a great relationship with Temple? It's because they got a new president. <laughs> And sometimes, you know, you can develop it immediately. 
Then other times, you just have to wait it out. And, you know, sometimes they wait you out. <laughs> and sometimes you got to what? Wait them out um, to make sure those relationships continue. 